morning and welcome to the standing committee meeting for Wednesday, September 22nd, 2021. Council will continue to meet in a hybrid format until further notice. We encourage speakers to continue registering and speaking virtually as there is limited number of seats available in our council chambers. Our first order of business is public comment. I would like to remind all speakers that the rules of council state the comments are limited to matters of concern, official action, or deliberation, which are or may be before city council, and profanity will not be permitted. Um, please provide your name and your neighborhood for the record. Our first speaker is Dr. Ronald Miller. Dr. Ronald and Miller, Belts Hoover on the south side. Uh, are you all fit for office? Uh, founder of 2019, the Global Intelligence Information Network and 2020, the National Intelligence Information Network. I have a network that includes all state capital uh, city governments and the major newspapers in those cities. Uh, Global Intelligence Society, GIS, um, anti-DPRP binary dominant candidate for a mayor in motion uh, 2021. Join me citizens for um, unscripted, uncensored, uh, street debates Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in District 6, Center at Kirkpatrick, District 5, um, Murray at Forbes, and District 9, Highland at Penn. Um, this council and the center which I founded and the Global Intelligence Society also founded by me, we share a concern, don't we, for Pittsburgh citizen body integrity, especially in this era of COVID, uh, and brand um, integration, innovation. Uh, orange Theory Fitness, um, Highmark Union Blue, Red Havas. I and the GIS uh, offer full spectrum um, black rainbow mirror to mirror solutions like these. They're not ours, but we really like them. Uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, the Orange Theory people are really going in East Liberty. Um, we need dynamic, multi dimensional visual, oral, olfactory, um, tactile information and intelligence, full blast, uh, full voltage, um, full aroma, if you like. Uh, we need leadership that is dynamic, energetic, and mobile. It fuses, in my view, globalism, samba, jazz, jazz uh, and goma, and flamenco. I do, I've created something that I call the Tao of Brain Body Interventionist um, Martial Science Art, which is not Jeet Kune Do. Um, so, uh, Come and we'll work that out. The mayor should be full rainbow. All district mobile should travel by Port Authority bus to each district. I advise this for counselors as well. Once every nine days to interact with Pittsburghers directly in person in continuous cycle. Um, let's have shady trees in all nine districts. I say yes to that. Um, have as few shady deals as possible. Now, how can we do that? I have some suggestions. As I have said here uh, previously, open the door from the mayor's office into this room, uh, open the door outside on the fifth floor, um, turn the cameras on so that everything inside of the meetings of uh, the mayor's offices, whether they're inside or outside of these rooms, uh, is open to the public. All the deals should be out in the open. Um, mayor Sunlight, uh, not shade mayors anymore. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Laura Cantina, followed by Naomi Mullen. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Laura Cantina, and I am a veterinarian in Pittsburgh. I almost lost my life back in 2009 when one particular feline patient who was previously denuckled bit my hand. Because of my injury, I had extensive surgery. I was in the hospital for a week and then had seven months of intensive and painful physical therapy in order to regain the use of my hand. When I was injured, I was healthy and not immunocompromised. I do believe had I been immunocompromised when I was bit that I would not be alive today. As a veterinarian, it is my job to not only protect the health of animals, but also the health of humans. It is part of the oath that veterinarians take to protect public health. And I know from my veterinary education, my time in practice, as well as my personal experience of enduring a cat bite injury, 
that these bites are serious and potentially life-threatening. Cat scratches do not nearly pose the same risk in any regard whatsoever. When cats are subject to the cruel and inhumane surgery of denuckling, they are more likely to bite. Their defenses of using their claws has been eliminated. There are options for pet owners to manage their cat's nails, such as nail ca caps, regular nail trims at home or at the veterinarian's office. Because of my injury and my mission to deter pet parents from this cruel and barbaric surgery, I develop gloves anxious pet owners can wear to trim nails at home, if that is the option they choose. There are many options, but the practice of denuckling surgery directly goes against my oath as a veterinarian to not only protect animals, but also to protect the health of the public. Thank you. Thank you. We now have Naomi Mullen, followed by Jacqueline Kafaro. Good morning. Thank you for the insights from the previous two speakers. Naomi Mullen from Bonaire. Shady trees, not shady deals in Bonaire. Teresa Kale Smith, you and I were part of the fight to save Bonaire School and others from closure. Will you pledge support for a green space to replace the school? Are there any other council members who will support Bonaire green space? Or do you not think that safe, stable neighborhoods are a good thing? Ed Ganey showed up late to our large town hall meeting and told Anthony Coghill he supported us. Bruce Krauss has said he supports Bonaire green space. The time is now to stop the strongly opposed Gregory development. We, the people of Bonaire, are real stakeholders. We actually own property and pay taxes. We deserve respect. My sincere, consistent request is that City Council create a resolution to block zoning, change, and support a green space to replace Bonaire school building. Do your part for the environment, reduce urban heat, reduce watershed to Route 51, increase green space to benefit all ages and stages, protect the children at the playground across the street. Let's make it wheelchair accessible to allow those who have poor access to nature the ability to enjoy it. Tear down problem buildings, not safe, stable neighborhoods. You want to reduce watershed to Route 51, and this is your opportunity to help that. Shady trees, not shady deals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Jacqueline Kofaro, followed by Kelsey Fedor. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Jackie Kofaro, and I run Cat Calls Rescue. It's a Pittsburgh-based rescue located in Councilman Krause's district. Um, I have been involved in cat rescue for a decade. It is an unpaid time in intensive volunteer position. And I do this because of my love of cats and my passion for animal welfare. Um, these are the reasons I'm also speaking in front of you today. I want nothing but what is best for cats and I want them to live bright pain free futures where their paws remain fully intact. Um, our rescue has a thorough adoption process, and the first step is having potential adopters complete our adoption application. And the most important question on this application is if they plan to declaw their future cat or kitten and why. And the vast majority of applicants say no. Um, many have passionate responses like, no, I would never, or never, cats need claws. Um, we do, however, receive a small number of individuals who say that they're not sure or that they will consider when they adopt the pet. And to these people, we send a lengthy explanation on the true nature of declawing and the negative behavioral and physical side effects that come along with declawing. We also give many declawing alternatives that people may not have considered. So many people who consider declawing do not know that it's truly an amputation of the last bone in each toe. Declawing is often touted as a routine procedure that allows cats and couches to live in harmony. Uh, that's very rarely, if ever, go over the negative side effects that come along with declawing, such as biting, litter box issues, and painful arthritic paws. We have found that once people are educated on the topic of declawing and provided with appropriate alternatives, they quickly decide that it is an unnecessary and inhumane procedure that they're no longer considering. 
I have personal experience with this as my mom deep thawed my first kit, uh, kitten when I was younger, the vet misled her to believe that it was a casual way to protect her furniture. They didn't explain the procedure to her or give her any alternatives to deter scratching. And to this day, she says she really regrets it and she would never do it again. Um, also, as a rescuer, you know, we see many declawed cats and kittens that have escaped outside or allowed outside by their owners. I personally rescued and adopted a 17 year old cat who's living outside in a trailer park crawling with aggressive, unfixed males, and she was declawed and unable to protect herself. Claws are a cat's first line of defense, so if they get outside, they're truly incapable of protecting themselves from other cats and animals that may try to harm them. Rescuing is my passion. We put so much love and energy into these cats, and it's heartbreaking to think that after all the care they've received that they may be mutilated for the sake of saving someone's furniture. With so many effective alternatives, there's truly no need for cats to have their claws removed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelsey Funeral, followed by Carol Whaley. Good morning, and thank you, committee members. I am Kelsey Gilmore Funeral. I am a legislative attorney for Best Friends Animal Society, and I'm here to ask this committee to issue a favorable report on ordinance 2021-1877 on the decline of cats. We have two primary reasons for supporting this ordinance. Many of my colleagues will speak about the cruelty related to the practice of cat denuckling, but I wanted to address the data and any concerns this body might have that this ordinance would result in a deluge of surrendered cats because of the decline or the inability to declaw. Behavior is not a significant reason for owner surrender of cats. My organization collected data on owner surrendered cats from January 2018 through September 2020 in Pennsylvania. Only 5% of cats were surrendered for non-aggressive personality issues, and only 1.5% of cats were surrendered due to aggression issues. The statewide data indicates this ordinance is not likely to result in large numbers of cats being surrendered to shelters because owners cannot elect to denuckle their pet. Furthermore, Best Friends Animal Society Sanctuary has received cats as owner surrenders after declawing because the pain caused the cat to become ornery and develop behaviors that were unmanageable. For these reasons, Best Friends Animal Society respectfully requests this body issue a favorable report on Ordinance 2021-1877, and I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Carol Whaley, followed by Sarah McKee. I'll reserve my testimony for the discussion on this bill when it is called. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sarah McKee. Hi, my name is Sarah McCain, and I am the chair of the board of directors at Animal Friends. I've also been a volunteer at Animal Friends for 30 years, since 1991. When I first began volunteering, I would say that probably 15 to 20 percent of our cat population uh, were declawed cats, most of whom were surrendered because of inappropriate litter box use or because they were biting their owners which is a common uh, defense mechanism with declawed cats. Um, as the, a lot of them, when they came in, were not, uh, were surrendered for different reasons other than inappropriate litter box use. They, people would say that they were uh, moving or they didn't have time for them. Um, and what we ended up doing would be placing these cats with people who wanted a declawed cat but did not want to declaw one themselves. And six months later, they would be returned for litter box use. So we had a lot of boomeranging cats going in and out of the shelter for inappropriate elimination. So it, as time went on in, into the 2000s, we started to see a decline. And I think probably largely because many veterinarians realized what a cruel process this was and stopped uh, doing the decline surgery. 
Uh, I personally, like one of the previous speakers, also had a collect cat that was already declawed when I got him. He had inappropriate litter box use his entire life. Uh, and we uh, you know, managed, managed through it by uh, placing litter boxes pretty much all over the house. So I'm very strongly in favor of council uh, supporting this bill and hope that you all vote to uh, approve it. And I thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you very much. So then our next speaker will be Maxine Young. Good morning, Pittsburgh City Council, and thank you for considering this important issue and the opportunity to present on this topic. My name is Maxine Young and I am representing the Humane Society of the United States. The Humane Society of the United States, the nation's largest animal protection organization, supports passage of Ordinance 1877 introduced by Councilman Bobby Wilson and an additional three council members, which would end the practice of decline cats in the city of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has the chance to follow eight major cities in California, Denver, Colorado, St. Louis, Missouri, Austin, Texas, as well as New York State in banning this cruel and unnecessary procedure. Additionally, Mars Veterinary Health, the largest veterinary hospital system in the US, which operates more than 2000 locations of VCA, Banfield, and Blue Pearl clinics, and employs 10% of all practicing veterinarians in the US, stopped offering declaw surgery to their clients in February of 2020. The HSUS encourages respect, responsible pet ownership and never condones cruelty, which is exactly what declawing is for cats. Knowing that safe and viable alternatives to declawing exist, it is hard to imagine that any veterinary office would allow the amputation of a cat's toes for the sake of their owner's convenience. Unfortunately, it happens to 24.4% of domestic cats, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association. Declawing is not fully condoned by any veterinary medical association, and that includes the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association. The time to end the practice of declawing is now. On behalf of our members and supporters in Pittsburgh, the HSUS supports passage of Ordinance 1877, a humane ordinance which will protect the health and well being of family cats. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Shedka. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tara Chekai, and I'm a Brighton Heights resident in Councilman Wilson's district. And I'm also a Humane Society of the United States Humane Policy Volunteer Leader. And I'm speaking in favor of the legislation to protect cats from declawing. I want to speak on the burden that surrendered declaw cats puts on foster parents. Shelters and rescues have a finite amount of foster parents, and not all foster parents are equipped to handle medical trauma cases. Declawed cats who are surrendered to rescues and shelters due to physical and behavioral issues from denuckling surgery typically need a very special foster home arrangement. Declawed cats are hard to adopt out because of their long-term pain, discomfort, trauma, litter box aversion, and increased propensity for biting. This generally means that declawed cats become long-term fosters. Longevity of hard-to-place cats puts a real strain on fosters because these cats take up foster slots, and this limits the amount of other animals' lives that can be saved through fostering. Declawed cats that are hard to adopt also take a financial toll on fosters, rescues, and shelters by using more supplies and generally need more palliative care than a standard non-medical foster. Fostering these traumatized animals also takes an emotional toll on foster parents and contributes to compassion fatigue. Thank you for your consideration of this legislation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amanda Zetwell. Good morning. I'm Dr. Zetwell. Thank you for having me. I am the medical director of Animal Friends Clinic and Community Services. We offer affordable veterinary care for our community. That includes, but is not limited to, low cost, but high quality, high volume spay and neuter, a variety of soft tissue and minor orthopedic procedures, comprehensive dentistry, 
a full general practice with ultrasound capabilities and vaccines. We have a partnership contract with the city of Pittsburgh for residents to receive discounted spay and neuter services. Very quickly, onchiectomy or declaw or denuckling is actually between 10 and 18 individual amputations of a cat's first toe digit on their feet. Though others will speak to the adverse effects of this procedure, I wanted to discuss the veterinarian's role. I've been in the veterinary field for over 19 years, almost seven of which as a doctor. Over the years, I have seen different generations present their cats for this procedure for a variety of reasons. As a veterinarian, my responsibility is to be an advocate for my patient. Clients, the owners, you know, they're going to have things in their life, their personal life. And though it's a factor, it, it's more in my periphery. My focus will always be the patient in front of me. I believe this law would help veterinarians to be able to advocate better for their patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. That does exhaust our list of registered speakers. Are there any speakers with us in chambers? Seeing none, we will now move on to our city committee agenda. Will the clerk please take the roll? Reverend Burgess. Aye. Mr. Coghill. Ms. Gross. Mr. Krause. Here. Mr. O'Connor. Mrs. Kel Smith. Here. Ms. Strasberger. Here. Mr. Wilson. Here. Mr. Lavelle Chair. Here. Six members present. Thank you. Um, our first committee of the day is Finance and Law, chaired by myself. We have one supplemental paper, Bill 1903. Bill 1903. Resolution authorizing pursuant to Chapter 210 of the City Code, the Mayor and Director of the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure to accept a donation from the Jewish Community Center of Greater Pittsburgh in the amount of $12,500 for traffic calming on Darlington Road and further amending Resolution Number 647 entitled Resolution Adopting and Approving the 2021 Capital Budget and the 2021 CDBG Program the 2021 through 2026 capital improvement program by increasing complete streets by $12,500. There's no approved. Second. Approve. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Councilwoman Gross. I'm not actually asking a question about this bill. I support it. I just wanted to say here, I'd stepped away from for another cup of coffee. My apologies. Will be noted. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Bill is recommended. Our new paper, Bill 1847. Bill 1847, resolution authorizing the city clerk to enter into an agreement or a contract with an attorney or a law firm approved by council for various legal services as they arise on behalf of Pittsburgh City Council in an amount not to exceed $30,000. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Uh, we have two, I see President Smith and I saw Councilwoman Gross. I'm just curious, um, I know we talked about this, I'm just curious about the amount. It seems so low. Sure. Um, can I, if, if, yes. you let me do an interrogative. Um, this will be a two-step two process. Um, this will get us through this years, which is only a few months and then we will add the position into next year's budget. So that's why it's, it's so that we can um, start our search process immediately and have someone in place. Um, and so that's why the amount is small, but it will then be put into next year's budget at a full amount. This is just, that's, this is one search committee in place. We'll put a search committee in place. That's why I wanted to make sure that that's clear. But, um, but I want to thank you, Reverend, because you're putting in some legislation. Uh, people may notice some of the legislation you've put in and some of the legislation you're going to put in. And I want to be clear that you've been talking with council's leadership and we've been talking to other members about what we're doing. And for years, I've, I've sat here and Councilwoman Gross can t attest to this. I've said I'm so frustrated that we don't have people to help us with the legislation that we want to do for our communities and that we don't have our own um, 
legal process that we can that we know that the opinions that we're getting um, are the people that are working for council and for our constituency. Even though I think our law department does an amazing job, um, they oftentimes report or feel that they need to report directly to a mayor. But we've talked about strengthening council uh, for years. I've said for years that we come in here, we know because we know we knew the past few mayors because they served on council with some, many of you and with myself. Um, I never served with Luke Ravenstall, but I served with him as a mayor. But I think you all, when I got here, you already had your relationships with him. And so you felt comfortable with um, working with him and doing things uh, and trusted that he was doing what was best. I don't, I never understood that we work and mayors try to get five votes, what they often try to do in city council. I never understood that because I didn't understand why we didn't stand together as a body, as the, really the body that should be holding people accountable and that there are some checks and balances in place. And not to say that we don't want to work with any administration. I think we always want to work with the mayor. Reverend Burgess says it best that, you know, it's a strong mayoral form of government and we want to work with the um, mayor and we want to see every mayor be successful because if they're not successful, our city's not successful. But having said that, council needs to be able to vote no on things because that's what they believe, not because they think that something's going to happen, not because they think that your district's gonna pay a price, not that they think that somebody's gonna come after you politically. We need to do what we think is best because it's best and that's what this council should be doing. So to work independently, but with any administration. And I think Reverend Burgess is, I say this all the time, I, I, Reverend Burgess and Dan Laval were two of the brightest council people I've ever seen, or elected officials I've ever seen. If we'd work with them, we could do a lot more to strengthen our council. And I think we've had meetings um, over the past several months. And actually I've been talking to Councilman Gross about this for years, that council needs to strengthen council and council needs to have more of a voice. And these pieces of legislation that Reverend is putting in, he's working with others, but he is definitely um, just really brilliant in putting them together. So, and making sure that council is going to have a voice. I want the public to know you're gonna see a stronger council coming forward thanks to the legislation um, that he's been putting forward. And that's for all of us, all nine members work as a body. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Gross. Thank you. So yeah, it doesn't say here that this is, it says, and I'm scrolling on my screen here. It says contractor contracts with attorney, attorney, attorneys or law firm, but this is about, just to be clear, hiring a council solicitor, excuse me for my printer going off there. Um, and so we should be public, I think, about the process for contracting. Um, as Councilman Burgess always reminds us, contracting always happens through the administration. So that's my question. How is a contract executed here? Now, council gets to um, elect its own city clerk and do that hiring. Um, the clerk officially hires, I think, the, uh, all the staff um, under her payroll, including our budget directors, but I've never lived through that because we've had the same budget director now for some 35 years. Um, right. And so I'm not clear on two things. So, so how does council do the contracting? Does the administration get to pick this law firm or so lawyer? I can answer the question. And, and then secondly, how do we do the um, hiring when we get to that point? Thank you. Okay. So if you don't mind, I don't mind present there. I guess. I mean, who is, who is speaking to these bills, right? So I, can, I, guess I, can, I can answer the question. I just wanted to make sure um, we've been talking privately with the president and make sure she it's okay with me answering the question. So um, technically everything on council side is underneath the clerk's office in terms of budgetary. So that's kind of how it works. When you look at the budget, uh, even council members, all of everything, our offices, our staff, our supplies are all under the clerk's office. Uh, the solicitor is a charter mandated role. So it is not an extra role. It's, a, it's, it's actually written in the home rule charter. Um, um, years ago, we were going to fill this position. And so what will happen is the, 
president, and, and it's okay if I, if I yeah. talk public, uh, the president will, and she, she's going to do it, for, I think, fairly soon, she will set up um, a search committee uh, that will involve four council people, a clerk's office, and I think an advisor from the law department to go through um, the search and to recommend three finalists to council. Council as a whole, all nine of us would interview those three similar, this is very similar to how we did the city's clerk search. If you remember the city's clerk search um, that got us, uh, uh, Ms. Bree, this is the same process. And then we would um, um, recommend, I mean, that, that group nine would select uh, the person. Um, that person would be hired between now and the end of the year um, or with this money and contract it through the clerk's office. And then starting next year, um, they will be put in the city's budget. So that's the process. Okay, okay. So it isn't, you know, doing, uh, executing a contract and then doing a hiring process later. You're front, we're front ending the hiring process. We're just putting them under um, professional contract before they would be able to be on payroll for 2022. Right. Got it. When will we hear about the, um, Selection committee that's narrowing the down I have to it in my so mind, council. The clerk's office, we narrowed it down to three or four candidates, I think. If if you allow an interrogatory with Madam President, I think she wants to respond. So I already talked and discussed with uh, Reverend Councilman Lavelle. Um, and I already thought of the members that should be on it. And I talked a little bit with the council with the clerk yesterday that it would be her, uh, Madam Clerk, it would be, of course, Reverend Burgess, Councilman Lavelle, and you, and um, one other member. And so, okay. uh, so those, those are the ones I came up with so far. Thank so you. You're on the list. Thank you, Madam President, I would be honored. <laughs> Great, so, okay, so we're, the hiring process would start now, but then, again, we're just covering basically a contract through the 2021 budget and then payroll through 2022. So that is much, much clearer. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have now. Thank you. Any Anyone else for a discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. That moves us to our invoices. Need a motion to approve the invoices? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Invoices are approved. We need a motion to approve the P cards. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? P cards are approved. That moves us to Public Safety Services Committee, chaired by Councilman O'Connor. One deferred paper, Bill 1834. Bill 1834, resolution amending resolution number 608, authorizing the mayor and director of public safety to enter on behalf of the city into an amended professional services agreement with the center that cares for the purpose of continued implementation of the Pittsburgh Group Violence Intervention Street Outreach Program at an overall cost not to exceed $9,410,417. Motion to approve. Second. Any Sorry. discussion? Yes. Councilman Wilson. Uh, I have a amendment uh, sent to all members last night, and the amendment effectively uh, incorporates what we've already contracted with Operation Better Block uh, to provide the infrastructure. So it just explicitly says that in this bill as well. Second. What? That's a formal motion. Motion to amend. Yes. And second. second. Any further discussion on the amendment? Council yes, Smith? Mr. Chair. All right, Council President Smith and Councilwoman Strasberger. Thank you. I just want to thank Councilman Wilson and his staff uh, for making this easier for me to vote on. I, I, I have a lot of concerns about it. I don't know that I'll vote for another contract like this when it comes up um, because of the reporting um, not being where we as council members thought it should be. But I do want to say also one of the things that gave me hope was, uh, well, I'll talk about that when we're done, but I just want to thank Councilman Wilson and his team because they really came up with some good solutions and he had a lot of conversations with me um, because people he was talking to, I know he wasn't just talking with me, he was reaching out to a lot of people and spending a lot of time on this amendment. So I wanna thank him for always trying to find a compromise and solution. 
Thank you, Council Ms. Schrossberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could have an interrogatory with Councilman Wilson, I, I it did receive the, amend, the amendment language, I read it. And my question is, and I apologize for missing the briefing yesterday, I had a conflicting meeting at the same time. What do we mean by infrastructure? I saw the, the additional wording. What, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about infrastructure there? So when we originally contracted with um, Center for Cares, they were, um, uh, that was before the Operation Better Block contract. And um, this is maybe, you know, at least a, a year ago when we contracted with Operation Better Block, but the Center for Cares was already under operation. They, they were already operating with outreach workers before that. So when we got to the, the bill of Operation Better Block, um, which provides um, infrastructure, which is essentially an, an app on a phone that um, was uh, created in partnership with um, Operation Better Block and CMU to uh, to provide resources to the outreach workers, and also um, there's like a f there's a full um, accountability there with um, the way they measure um, the, where violence is in the in the city, and uh, we should um, you know it would be great to set something up with you and Operation Better Block to go over that because there's a nice dashboard where you can see uh, what's going on. So this is. Um, just effectively incorporating that into all outreach work that's being done in the city of Pittsburgh. Excellent. Thank you for the explanation and for your work on the amendment. I'm in support. And I would take you up on the offer to be connected to um, those who can give me a briefing on or a, uh, a tour of the dashboard. Thank you. All right, we'll set that up. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Councilman Krauss. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to uh, thank Shatira for um, her, uh, her diligent engagement with me over the last, I don't know how many days now, um, to help me better understand the, um, the, the, the availability and distribution of the funds, um, how they can um, ultimately be dispersed, uh, what limitations there may be, um, and the additional funds for other, uh, organizations to build better capacity by which um, they can uh, they can access the dollars it was a very complex and complicated conversation but uh, uh, Ms. Murphy really uh, rose to the task and uh, held my hand and helped me to understand uh, a very complicated um, Discussion. So I just wanted to publicly thank Shatira. Shatira, you're here. I, I know if you wish to to add anything uh, this morning, you're welcome to. I know we've had a very, very long, long conversation about this, and I don't mean to extend it any further, but I did want to give you the opportunity to add anything if you wish to uh, to do so. Um, I don't wish to add anything uh, necessarily pertaining to the contract, but just simply take a moment to thank you all um, for your patience and your willingness to really dive deep into, like you said, Councilman Kraus, such a complex situation and really understand um, all the moving pieces, but ultimately like how they all work together. So I just want to thank each uh, council person present for really just taking the time to um, talk with me about all of this and talk through this with me and uh, get a better understanding. And I'm really excited to move forward and to work with you all closely on violence prevention efforts in your district and also commu supporting community-based organizations who are focused on violence prevention efforts in your districts. Thanks, Chair, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion? We're still on the amendment. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The bill is amended. Any discussion on the bill as amended? Councilwoman Gross and Council President Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I also wanted to thank the Stop the Violence team and, and Ms. Murphy for giving us the extra briefing yesterday. Um, I took a full page of notes and I really learned a lot. So I really, I did, um, I think I am a lot more comfortable. I have a much better picture. And I just wanted, if, if you indulge me for a minute to mention some of the things um, that I heard while you're here, because I think it's really important work 
and I think it's important for the public to hear about it in a little more detail. The things that stuck with me from the briefing were that you have outreach workers that are going um, to every place where there are especially young people who might be in conflict, but not only young people, also family members and anyone grieving who's been impacted by violence. So we heard about people going to schools um, to do de-escalation, to funerals, to um, major events like public events like 4th of July, excuse my dog, um, tracking um, you know, prison release and probation, but also lending helping hands. So connecting grieving family members with grieving resources, um, and then also basic human resources. And we've really heard a call from the public to invest in communities. Um, and so I really see these funds as, as that work as well, because we heard about um, connecting people to housing and connecting people to food so they can be more food secure, um, families so they can be more food secure if they've lost the breadwinner in a family, um, connecting people um, in our neighborhoods with job opportunities, both through Partner for Work and the Trade Institute of Pittsburgh. Um, and so I'm really eager for us to be moving um, towards being able to report out um, to the public. And that's what we heard in the briefing, the software can help us do. Um, so it will hide people's identities, it will redact and also kind of just aggregate. Um, so we can just see numbers, like how many people in communities um, are getting you know, job placements? Have they stayed with job placements? Are they, you know, how many people have we used these funds to connect to housing? Um, and, um, and then we'll also be tracking our kind of violence incidents and see if hopefully those will go down because that is the goal that people are safer and more secure um, in all of the aspects, right? Housing security, your job secure, wage secure, but also you know, secure from violence. So I really appreciate the briefing helping uh, connect the dots. <laughs> and um, I think Mr. Wilson's amendment will help us um, put in the contract um, that there's a system for tracking um, how these dollars have positively impacted communities. So that will, I think, uh, be able, uh, make me, makes me a lot more comfortable. This is a very sizable contract. Um, again, just for the record, for citizens, if you're looking at the text of the bill, it's going from some like 300,000 per year to 600,000 for 2021, but then 2 million for 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025. I have otherwise objected to us kind of locking up um, many millions of dollars into future years. Uh, but I think with the reporting out, we can, we'll know and we can be confident and the public can be confident whether this is the right um, contract um, to get the right results for that amount of money. So um, I just wanna to say thank you. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Okay, I appreciate it. I'm supportive, Mr. Chair, that's all I have. Thank you, Council President. I just want to um, also thank Shachira for talking with, with me about this. Um, I did not make the briefing either because I had members and others in my office at the time. Um, and when I logged on, it was already over. So, um, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me. But one of the things I think that we need to put in and consider for the 22 budget is a manager or an assistant for Shachira because I think it'd be good to have somebody who oversees this program and reports to the public, reports to council, um, and make sure that there's some training and some um, help available for people in the reporting process and making sure that they're, they're understanding how this uh, system works. Because we're expecting people to do things that maybe they don't necessarily know. They may know the streets, they may know the job, they just may not know the technology. So I think having somebody who oversees that, and Shatira can't be all things to all people all the time. So I just want to say with that said, Councilman Wilson's legislation made it easier for me to vote for this today. And plus, I think that it's you know already under contract. So I, I think there's very little we can do at this point. But I do think moving forward, we have to have better reporting um, and a help uh, for those responsible for doing the program. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wilson. Yes, first off, I just want to thank uh, Councilman Lavelle and Councilman Burgess for uh, beginning the outreach contract, you know, the, beginning the outreach some years ago under a much smaller contract. 
And I just think it's uh, important to talk about outreach in general and what we've been doing at the city of Pittsburgh to enhance outreach, not just for, um, you know, outreach that connects directly with GVI, group violence intervention, but, you know, specifically how we're really creating this outreach that taps into what everyone calls the continuum of care. We also contract with AHN, Urban Poverty and Homelessness. They run the program for outreach. We just, we're working on expanding that citywide for all zones. And there's also a county program called River where they work with reentry with um, people coming out of the jail and coming back into society, making sure that they have an appointment with their PCP, things like that. And this is all gonna be interconnected. I mean, this, uh, this group violence intervention uh, teams, they already work and uh, coordinate some stuff with, with the AHM program. So it's really just trying to, you know, whenever we talk about outreach workers showing up on the scene, you know, there's a lot of things that are identified and if they can, the outreach worker can continually just, you know, uh, relay this information and work directly with other outreach teams um, they may be able to tap in and, and really fill in where, um, you know, with their expertise. But I just think we're really on a good path here in the city of Pittsburgh to continue on um, with this type of work. So I appreciate everyone who supported this. Thank you very much. Anyone else first round? If not, second round, President Smith. Oh, I just wanted to add that I appreciate the work of Cornell Jones and um, uh, Sergeant Glick. I think that they um, are doing a tremendous, Cornell is so great on the streets. Everybody I talk to loves him, says all kinds of great things. And Sergeant Glick is so respected for the work that he does. I think that they also do. So I just want to acknowledge the entire team, Director History, uh, Shatira, Cornell Jones, and, and uh, Sergeant Glick, and whoever else is involved. I want to thank them for their work on this, but also understand that when we're dealing with this, we're reporting to the public how the money is being spent, and it's important to us. Obviously, I want to thank Councilman Laval and Councilman Burgess for creating it and trying to mm -hmm. do something different about violence in the city. But I, I think when we're reporting, when we're spending any kind of public dollars, I always want, um, especially with um, nonprofits involved, I want a higher level of accountability that we can make sure that we can report back to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I got to go another round for that because I want to thank Cornell Jones as well. I think he does a phenomenal job. When I came into the, the office and there was some increased violence in our area, I immediately started talking to uh, um, council members on how I can immediately understand what's what's happening with outreach. And uh, it was it's been a pleasure working with Cornell on several different um, you know, things that are situations that are happening in my, in my community and how they effectively go out and, uh, and work with the, with the with my residents. So I just wanna give a shout out to him. I appreciate what Cornell does, what Ty Lee does, and uh, what Shatera does for, uh, for the city of Pittsburgh. Thanks. Thank you. If nothing else, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Thank you. That takes us to our one new paper, I'm still under public safety, which is Bill 1877. Bill 1877, ordinance amending the city of Pittsburgh code title six, article three, chapter 633, by adding a new subsect, a new section 63325, prohibiting the declawing of cats. Motion. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Discussion, Councilman Wilson. Yes, thank you. Uh, so to help me through this bill, for all members, I wanted to invite four people to the table. Um, Carol Whaley from Animal Friends, the Director of Human Programming, and Dan Rossi from Animal, Human Animal Rescue, Dr. Jennifer Conrad, uh, a vet from uh, the PAW Project, Jackson Galaxy, Cat Behavioralist. Can we uh, have um, them come to the table and and introduce themselves. Yes, I do believe they are with us. Just uh, put yourself on, turn, turn your camera on, unmute yourself. 
I see Miss Whaley first. Like me to go now? Yes, that'd be great. Okay. If, if everyone could um, introduce themselves and and uh, just a quick introduction. Sure. My name is Carol Whaley. I am a Lawrenceville resident in uh, Councilwoman Gross's district. And as well as Bobby said, uh, Councilman Wilson, I am the Director of Humane Programming at Animal Friends. I have about 18 years in the animal welfare and protection community here in Pittsburgh. And in that time, I've, I've handled and, and helped thousands of cats. So I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, Dan Rossi, if you're on. Hey, good morning. Yes, I'm Dan Rossi. I'm the CEO of Humane Animal Rescue of Pittsburgh. We operate two domestic animal shelters within the city of Pittsburgh, uh, one in the Homewood section um, in Burgess uh, district and one on the north side in Laval's district. Uh, although we also serve all the districts uh, through our services with animal care and control and the spay neuter contract that we have with the city as well. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Conrad. Hi, my name is Jennifer Conrad. I'm a veterinarian and I run the PAW Project, which is the world's largest nonprofit dedicated solely to ending declawing. And I have been involved in all the legislation in North America to ban declawing. And I have statistics to show that it's really a good idea for a city to do this. Jackson Galaxy. Hi, I'm Jackson Galaxy. I am a cat wellness and behavior expert. I've been working with cats for um, just about 30 years, both in shelters and in homes and on TV, um, where I'm a host of an Animal Planet TV show. All right, thanks everyone. And before I get started, I just want to thank all the speakers that came in support of, the, of this bill. Uh, so my bill is seeking to prohibit the the declining of cats in the city of Pittsburgh could um, could uh, Miss um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Conrad, could you please explain the um, what is non therapeutic declawing? Yes, thank you. Non therapeutic declawing is the amputation of every. Uh, last bone in a cat's paws because unlike our nails where the claw grows from skin in order to remove the nail of a cat you actually have to remove the bone so it's 10 amputations in the front and eight in the back because most cats have 18 toes uh, and it's done entirely for the convenience of keeping the animal it's done as a veterinarian, I went to vet school to protect cats, not couches. So it, it, to me, it is one of the most inhumane surgeries uh, at, on our, the list of things that veterinarians do. And I think veterinarians know better and want this to stop. Thank you. And, and for, I think this question is for Carol and uh, Dan. If you could um, just take turns, answer this question. Um, <clears throat> could you please explain the results of what happens with a cat when they're declawed? Maybe I'm thinking that you all could speak to this since you see the effects at your shelters. Sure, I'll go first uh, if Dan doesn't mind. Uh, we see through the shelter system declawed cats coming in that have behavioral issues. Uh, once the declaw is performed, oftentimes these cats will stop using the litter box due to residual pain or they will choose to bite in defense because they no longer have claws. In the shelter system, a cat that urinates outside of the litter box or bites is not the best candidate for adoption. Uh, this puts a lot of stress on shelter staff. You of course are there to care for that animal, to find it a, a loving home. And when that's an almost insurmountable task, it really does affect your morale. Um, and the staff around you as well. It's just a, a very sad situation for the cat who had a loving home, was declawed, now exhibits these behavioral issues and has been surrendered to a shelter. So it's a very difficult thing, not only for the cat, but for our sheltering system as well, to have to have these cats who are very difficult, if not impossible, 
to rehome. Thank you. Dan, do you have a, any, any further yeah, comment? Definitely. So uh, what, what Carol has uh, spoken to, we definitely see here at Humane Animal Rescue of Pittsburgh as well. Uh, Pre-COVID numbers of cats, we typically see about 5,100 cats every year come through our system here. I would say on average, two to 3% of them are cats that have been declawed. And the main reason individuals who are declawing, uh, surrendering these declawed cats are uh, because of behavior issues that uh, had developed after the declawing. Um, again, we're talking at significant, not, you know, 5,000 is a lot, but, you know, 2% of that, we're, we're talking 100, 150 cats coming into our system that we're trying to deal with uh, that have significant issues here. Just, just like uh, a used car, we need to disclose any behaviors of animals that we're trying to adopt out. And believe me, when we tell people, oh, this cat uh, bites or this cat might not use the litter box, you know, consistently, that cat is looked over time and time again. There are a certain number of people that are looking for decalled cats in the system. Uh, they will adopt them, uh, but often once they deal with these behaviors, they will return them as well. Uh, so it's a significant problem with us. Uh, it, it clogs up our system and there's many options. That we really don't have many options for these animals out there. Um, I personally took home a decog cat because he was biting. He bites to break skin and draw blood. Uh, I love Mr. Frickles. He is my buddy, he's my pal, but he does have this, this issue that uh, I experience and have to be very careful anytime I have friends or relatives over to the house. He has bitten uh, several people. I gotta keep him separated uh, at times. I need to make sure he's updated on his shots and vaccinations all the time. So it's not an easy relationship with us, but you know we understand each other. Not a lot of people are willing to go through that though. Uh, so so you know, moving this forward will really make a huge difference and an impact from what we experience and see here uh, at the shelter level. Thank you, ja uh, Jackson Galaxy. Could you? Uh, I don't have. You know, I'm trying to think about. Uh, you know, how you could share your thoughts on this bill. Uh, maybe you could speak to the behavior of the cats since you work directly with behavioral cats. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, just let me say from a personal perspective, when I started working with cats 30 years ago, I was a shelter worker for 10 years, and uh, that's where I started working with them. And I experienced uh, having to, to try to work with these guys as they were surrendered. Uh, for the exact uh, issues that we, we've been discussing, whether it's inappropriate biting or litter box issues, which I think uh, was the main reason they were surrendered. And as was mentioned by Dan also, I mean, when, when cats are surrendered for biting or litter box issues, those are the big ones. And it makes them very difficult uh, to find homes. Uh, unfortunately, as part of our job back then, not only uh, were we trying to save these cats, but we were responsible for the euthanasia. The first cat that I had to participate in euthanasia for um, that had uh, these issues because of declawing led to the passion I have today uh, for making sure that we outlaw this practice uh, in as many um cities and states as we possibly can so with that said uh it it's really hard for me all these years later to work with these cats in terms of uh, undoing the problems uh that they now have and the insecurities uh due to a distrust of humans and the pain that they still feel um, uh, they could have been declawed when they were kittens. Now they're 12 years old. They still experience pain. They still experience discomfort in the litter box. They still have a distrust when hands come towards them. And there's not a whole lot I can do still all these years later. And it's frustrating knowing that there are simple things that folks can learn to prevent the scratching of their furniture. It doesn't, there's no good reason for this practice 
and um, and and it's just it's heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking to have to um, watch these cats struggle through their lives and watch the relationship between cat and human break down completely just because initially somebody wanted to save their furniture and mm -hmm. they weren't educated both on the negative effects of this and uh, what they can do to save their furniture in the first place. Thank you. If this bill passes, um... I believe this would be the first city in Pennsylvania to pass this law. Can you can someone talk about the other cities that have done this and and um, maybe just name them for the record? Yes, I did a um, quick. I can. Uh, this is Jennifer Conrad. I uh, the first city in North America to pass to pass a ban was West Hollywood, California. That was subsequently followed by big cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Burbank, Culver City, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, and um, Berkeley, California. Then St. Louis, uh, Missouri, the county of St. Louis, Missouri, which they're different, uh, Denver, Colorado, and now the entire state of New York. And um, so far, eight of the 10 provinces in Canada. Now, remember, <clears throat> the decline is really only done in North America. It's not done in the rest of the world because they consider it inhumane and unethical. Mm -hmm. So I think that Pittsburgh deciding to join this group, it, it there shows that Pittsburgh is a leader and uh, cares so much about its animals. And I think it, that one other important thing to know is that you might hear that um, there's going to be this massive deluge of cats dumped into shelters if they can't be declawed. And that has not happened in any of those places I just uh, mentioned. And I wanted you to know that in Los Angeles, which is a city of 4.2 million people, that the relinquishment rate of, of uh, owned cats went down after the ban so much so, it went down 43%, so much so that the head of LA Animal Services says that she believes it's due to the ban. So the city is less burdened with animals that have to be killed because they're unadoptable. It's been good everywhere that it's passed. And I really sincerely hope that Pittsburgh will pass it. Thank you. I just have one final question before I open up the members. One criticism of the bill is that it prevents um, uh, vets from declining a cat when its owner has a serious health reason for, for you know, for a serious health reason, they, they don't want the cat to scratch them, and then they they take them in for a declaw. Um, you know, for instance, if someone's a hemophiliac, they don't want them to, um, you know, scratch them. How would you respond to that criticism? I I would respond to it by saying that the CDC, the NIH, the U.S. Public Health Services, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, all of these major health organizations say do not declaw the cat. The reason being is they know that declawed cats bite more and a bite wound is so much more dangerous than a scratch. If you call the emergency room and you say, I got scratched by a cat, they will say, please wash it and watch it. But if you say I've been bitten by a cat, which declawed cats absolutely bite more, it is in the literature, they will say, come in. And the Mayo Clinic says that one third of, of people who are bitten by cats have to be admitted for IV antibiotics. And that's not just for an hour. That is very often for seven to 10 days of IV antibiotics. So I think it gives people a false sense of security to think that declawing helps hemophiliacs or immunocompromised people or people on blood thinners or people with HIV. It doesn't they are putting them at risk because declawed cats absolutely bite more. And if I can follow up on that with just a, a personal anecdote, um, I, I think you all heard from Dr. Katina who uh, eloquently stated earlier today about her cat bite and the subsequent medical issues that she had that really jeopardized her career in veterinary medicine. I as well suffered a cat bite several years ago and this was as a healthy young person without an immunocompromised system, no bleeding disorders. And I did end up in West Penn Hospital on an IV antibiotic from that cat bite for about four to five days. 
So that is that is very true. I was bitten, received uh, oral antibiotics right away, and the next day the infection had traveled up to my shoulder. Well, thank you everyone for coming to um, City Council today and taking out your time, uh, take the, taking the time out of your day to come here. Uh, appreciate everyone. I'm finished. Any other members? Thank you. I have Councilman Kraus followed by President Smith. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Morning. So, good morning. So, uh, members, you, you see a veritable who's who uh, of uh, cat care, uh, animal care um, here before you this morning advocating for the passage of the bill. Uh, I, I'll share briefly a personal experience I, I had. I know members here are. Uh, aware of my love of cats and and as you got to meet my cat when he crashed a council meeting one uh, one uh, morning um, but my very first adoption was back in 1973 and I adopted from the Humane Society when I was living in Erie and I adopted a cat that was already declawed and I had really had never had any thought about it other than she came that way and um, really never gave it a second thought. Uh, but through the years, I had uh, uh, much difficulty with her ability to use a litter box. Uh, and she was with me 15 years. And that, I have to tell you, was a real struggle uh, to, to get through that. But I, I loved that cat with uh, heart and soul, and I wouldn't have surrendered her for anything. But uh, from personal experience, I will share with you that, um, and it's certainly you know, somewhat anecdotal and not uh, definitive, but I do have personal experience with having um, owned a cat that had been declawed and, uh, uh, and had serious litter box issues with her the, the entire time she was with me. So um, you know, I just, I wanted to validate uh, that point that was being made. Um, and I also would like to take a moment to thank Councilman Wilson uh, for the work on this, uh, for inviting me to uh, come on and be a sponsor, uh, co-sponsor with him, uh, and to also thank Councilman Coghill for taking the um, initiative to step forward and be a, um, a sponsor on the bill as well, too. So uh, I, I, I appreciate um, everyone that came to speak this morning. I appreciate the members' uh, consideration and support and ask that members please vote uh, in favor of the passage of uh, the bill this morning. And if anyone that is here wishes to offer any additional comment, I'm, I'm more than happy to open the floor uh, to you if you wish to add anything. President Smith. No? Okay, thank you. Thank you, President Smith. I just want to say, when I first saw this legislation, I'm not going to lie, I'm thinking, what are we doing now? But I want to say thank you, because I actually really became educated through this whole thing. Madam Clerk and I were sitting here making faces like, oh my God, they do that. They do. So I do want to thank you for the legislation and for working on it and for making us aware. Um, now if we can do something about some, some other things I'd like to bring to your attention because you did a really good job on this legislation, getting all the votes and, and getting it together. So thank you. But boy, you made a, you made a half hour presentation mm -hmm. out of a bill we were voting for as soon as you put it up. <laughs> so. yeah. Any Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, may I add additional comment? Sure, second round, Councilman Cross. Thank you. So, you know, I did some uh, uh, off the record research this morning to see just how many vets are here in, um, in the city of Pittsburgh. I came up with about 11, give or take. Uh, I, my number may be off a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, any number. Uh, one of the things I was really surprised to find was that there were only two vet, veterinarian uh, clinics south of the river. One is city vets here on the south side. The other one was, I believe, in Brookline um, and none north of the city. Uh, and many of them existed between the rivers um, and heading out uh, easterly. So, um, you know, that is something I would uh, love to encourage more um the um you know i think in in the years that i uh, that i've been privileged to be on council we have really um seen a uh, a very uh healthy uh desire for people to adopt uh to bring uh abandoned animals into their homes 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be out on city streets and see uh, dogs uh, leashed, uh, but out and about our, um, our off-leash exercise areas are doing so well. Uh, the new Kaufman's building uh, downtown, I, I, I had a meeting with the mayor a little while ago, and inside the Kaufman's building downtown is an indoor dog park for residents. And so um, it, it's just really encouraging to see those kinds of um, adaptive, uh, you know, approaches to caring for animals. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I would like to, to see more opportunities for veterinarians to come into the city of Pittsburgh uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to open business, because God knows there's, there's clearly a, uh, a market, uh, clearly a market for it. Um, and just sort of kind of wanted to, uh, to put that out there. And then secondly, you, you know, sometimes the unintended consequence of uh, legislation that we pass uh, can perhaps encourage people to go elsewhere to find the relief that they seek. And we certainly don't want to see that happen. And so perhaps Councilman Wilson, you and I might be able to have uh, some communication with uh, county council members um, so as to perhaps broaden the, uh, the, um, our approach uh, to ensure that perhaps um, uh, people are not seeking the, um, uh, you know, this, uh, this cruelty outside of city limits and perhaps, uh, you know, get uh, Allegheny County to understand that uh, there's a bigger picture here and we could actually get them to uh, sign on with us. Just a thought. Thank you. Any further Thank discussion? You. If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Aye. That moves us to Land Use and Economic Development Committee, chaired by Mr. Wilson. One new paper, Bill 1867. Bill 1867, the ordinance amended the Pittsburgh Code, Title V, Traffic, Article 7, Parking Chapter 549, Residential Parking Permit Program, so as to clarify the administrative process for the program, provide for virtual permitting, add the permit fees to the city's annual fee book, adopt regulations for the use of visitor permits and non-residence permits, and create the hybrid RPP area program. Motion to hold for one week. Second. All those, oh, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It will be held one week. Next is Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, chaired by Councilman Gross. Uh, first third paper is Bill 1368. Bill 1368, resolution adopting plan revision to the city of Pittsburgh's official sewer facilities plan for proposed land development located at the corner of Herion Avenue and Ruthven Street, including those parcels identified on the attached exhibit B. Question to approve a discussion. Second. Thank discussion, you. Councilman. Thank you. Um, so this was the one that was in court and unfortunately there has been a ruling um, that was not in favor of the community. Um, so that this is been through all of its planning steps and is ready for a vote. Uh, so uh, I kind of regret that the, the ruling was what it was, but that's what the court decided. So. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1519. Bill 1519, resolution adopting plan revision to the city of Pittsburgh's official sewer facilities plan for proposed land development located at 4554 and 4564 Penn Avenue at the parcels numbered. 49 M121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126. Uh, this was a motion to approve discussion. Second. Thank you. Uh, so these are the ones that ha have not gone through planning. I apologize that I keep holding them for several weeks and it, it doesn't seem to be moving forward at all. Um, so I think this time I'll motion for uh, to hold for four weeks. Your second on the hold four weeks. Yeah, I let me just let me make a comment. Can we, second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? It will be held four weeks. 
under new papers, Bill 1848. Bill 1848, resolution adopting plan revision to the city of Pittsburgh's official sewer facilities plan for the Garden Theater Block Project 23L76 and 23L83 in the 22nd Ward. Motion to approve. Second discussion. Discussion, Councilman Wilson? Yeah, so this is a very, you know, this sewage facility, one for the Garden Theater, is definitely important. Um, project has been stalled for 40 years, finally coming to fruition. But I just want to uh, talk generally about the sewage facility. I know Councilwoman and I uh, had met um, with, uh, you know, about this some time ago, but it's just, you know, I can't help this to look at uh, how we just need to incorporate this into, you know, like we're one of the checks along the way. And I, I get that you know, this comes before different items like planning and other things, just that it takes so long for these to come through for the for development. And just thinking about the garden theater and how that's been stalled, I just wouldn't want to, you know, stall other projects that have all the other, you know, that, that are working on the other things to align. Um, you know, my understanding is that they come into effect uh, regardless of our decision after 90 days. So, you know, if we take no action in 90 days, they, it automatically becomes effective. Thank you, Councilman Gross. Uh, that was the opinion of our of the mayor's law department. Uh, but now that we have our own solicitor, I can't wait to ask um, a new solicitor that exact question. Uh, so as we know, the lawyers often have opposite opinions. They certainly have different opinions when they appear, you know, from opposing sides in court. Um, and I maintain that the administration should not be sending these agent these sewer modules onto our agendas um, before there are other permits. And I also maintain that if there is an item that is in front of city council for a vote, it can be voted up or it can be voted down. Um, so it is not just another stop in the process. Um, the way that an administrative desk can't vote on behalf of the people up or down and must follow uh, regulatory procedures. So it is, it is qualitatively different. Um, but I look forward to um, continuing that discussion, but we don't have to do it today. So anytime, Mr. Wilson, I'm happy to talk further. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1849. Bill 1849, resolution adopting plan revision to the City of Pittsburgh's official soil facilities plan for 346 John Nair Street. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1850. Bill 1850, resolution providing for the execution of a cooperation agreement with the URA for the performance of certain work in connection with the 2021 and the 2022 CDBG program and providing for the payment of costs not to exceed $7 million $442,500, Council District All. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It is recommended, Bill 1851. Bill 1851, resolution authorizing a corporation agreement with the URA, designating URA as the city's agent for administration of the 2021-2022 Home Investments Partnership Program, Council Districts All. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Bill is recommended, Bill 1852. Bill 1852, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interests, if any, in and to the publicly owned property in the 20th Ward of the city designated in the deed registry office of Allegheny County Council Sorry. District number two, Safari Sorry. Avenue Southwest of Safari Avenue, south of Sherwood Avenue. 
Sorry, Madam Clerk, motion to approve discussion. <laughs> Second. Um, I wanted to give uh, Councilwoman Smith a chance to speak to this. I know that the, this is a bill that we were planning on holding. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilwoman. I just want to thank you for your diligence on this and making sure you um, brought it to my attention to ask if I was in favor. I just, I'm, I'm going to hold it for at least one week. Um, I have a meeting coming up with RA, and so I, we'll discuss it at that time. But whenever it comes to my district, I mean, people think that I'm protective. I am extremely protective and extremely controlling when it comes to my district. Sheridan in particular is an area that people went to jail for the things that they did in Sheridan. I mean, they went to jail from government, not from the community, from government, for what government did to Sheridan. So I'm going to always be extra careful and extra cautious when people are working in my community in general. But in this community that already has a, a tremendous distrust of government, I'm going to be extra cautious and making sure that the community is aware of what we're doing and that they're supportive and involved uh, prior to making decisions. So with that said, I, I would like to hold for at least one week. Motion to hold. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill be held one week. Bill 1853. Bill 1853, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, and into the publicly owned properties in the 13th Ward of the City, Council District 9, Nadir Way, Southwest corner of Nadir Way and Formosa Way. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 The opposed bill is recommended. Bill 1854. Bill 1854, a resolution approving execution of a contract for disposition by sale of land between the URA and Jackie Moore for the sale of Block 9M, Lot 176 in the Third Ward, Council District Number 6, Cliff Street, Side Yard Sale. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Recommended Bill 1855. Bill 1855 resolution approving execution of a contract by sale of land between the URA and Chris Stamler for the sale of Block 50M Lot 61 in the 10th Ward, Council District Number 9, Kincaid Street, Side Yard Sale. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Bill is recommended, Bill 1856. Bill 1856, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 12th ward of the city, Council District Number 9, Meadow Street, southwest side of Meadow Street, between Ashley and Paulson Avenue. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1857. Bill 1857, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 15th Ward, Council District Number 5, Lytle Street, east side of Lytle Street, south of West Elizabeth Street. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1858. Bill 1858, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 12th ward of the city, Council District Number 9, Meadow Street, southeast side of Meadow Street, north of Paulson Avenue. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Uh, Bill 1859. Bill 1859, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right title and, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 5th Ward, Council District Number 5, 826 and 828, Shawnee Street. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1860. Bill 1860, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right title and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 18th Ward, Council District Number 3, 844 Gearing Avenue and 814 Delmont Avenue. Motion to approve. Second. 
Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Bill is recommended, Bill 1861. Bill 1861, resolution approving execution of a contract for disposition by sale of land between the URA and Rose Street Ventures for a related entity for the sale in the Fifth Ward, Council District Number 6, 2117, 2119, 2120, 23, 25, and 27 Rose Street. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1862. Bill 1862, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 12th Ward, Council District Number 9, Lincoln Avenue, north side of Lincoln Avenue, east of Winslow Street. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 1863. Bill 1863 resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right title and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the fourth ward, council district number six, two Seneca Street and three Seneca. Motion to approve. Second. In discussion, saying none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Bill is recommended. Our last bill, Bill 1864. Bill 1864, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the publicly owned properties in the 12th Ward, Council Districts number 9, 979, 981, 983, 85, and 987, Washington Boulevard. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Bill is recommended. That exhausts our agenda for today. Um, next week, Council will hold the regular and standing committee meetings on Tuesday, September 28th and Wednesday, September 29th at 10 a.m. Speaker registration closes at 9 a.m. on the morning of those meetings. To register to speak at upcoming meetings, go to the Council meeting webpage and fill out the sign-up form in its entirety by the registration deadlines. You may also call the clerk's office at 412-255-2138 or email City Clerk's Office at PittsburghPA.gov. Are there any announcements from members? Councilwoman Gross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to follow along on some bills and I expected there to be a bill that was introduced last Tuesday, but I don't have the number. Um, I could swear it was introduced last, I believe last Tuesday. I think it's 1846. I believe you're referring to the bill that Reverend Burgess introduced. Yeah, yes, it was definitely sponsored by Councilman Burgess. That bill has to, we have to give the mayor 30 days for input before we discuss it. So it won't come back to our agenda until after the 30 day mayoral review period. October 20th, I believe. And is, that must be part of our code. It's not Humboldt Charter. I'm yes. Sure. It's a, which one is it? Code or? Oh. Thank you. I didn't know that part. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Anything else from members? If not, we need a motion to excuse the absent members, uh, approve the minutes and adjourn the meeting. So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Or adjourn. Thank you, Council.